There are all sorts of opinions about Jesus. Who do you say I am? That's the question Jesus puts to us today in this, our final episode in this series called Seeing Jesus Clearly. Thanks for joining me. I'm Jeff Gertson. We're St. Stephen's Church. 2021 is the year of gentleness. There is a king of glory. There is a God who saves. Welcome. I read from Mark chapter 8 and verse 22. And they came to Bethsaida, and some people brought to him a blind man and begged him to touch him. And he took the blind man by the hand and led him out of the village. And when he had spit on his eyes and laid his hands on him, he asked him, Do you see anything? And he looked up and said, I, I see men, but they look like trees walking. Then Jesus laid his hands on his eyes again, and he opened his eyes. His sight was restored. And he saw everything clearly. And he sent him to his home, saying, Do not even enter the village. And Jesus went on with his disciples to the villages of Caesarea Philippi. And on the way he asked his disciples, Who do people say that I am? And they told him, John the Baptist, and others say, Elijah, and others, one of the prophets. And he asked them, But who do you say that I am? And Peter answered him, You are the Christ. And he strictly charged them to tell no one about him. And he began to teach them that the Son of Man must suffer many things and be rejected by the elders and the chief priests and the scribes and be killed and after three days rise again. And he said this plainly. And Peter took him aside and began to rebuke him. But turning and seeing his disciples, he rebuked Peter and he said, Get behind me, Satan, for you're not setting your mind on the things of God, but on the things of men. This is God's word to us today. Let's pray. Dear Father, help us to see, help us today to really see Jesus clearly. Help us to answer that question, who do people say that I am? We ask for Jesus' sake. Amen. Well, going out for breakfast can be a complicated business. The waiter asks you, do you want white toast, brown toast, sourdough, rye or whole wheat? Do you want coffee, decaf, Ceylon or rooibos? Do you want hot milk or cold milk, lactose-free, almond or soy with your drink? Do you want your eggs sunny side up or easy over? Pork or beef sausage, butter or margarine? So many decisions need to be made just to get your breakfast. It's truly wonderful, isn't it, to live in a day when we have so many choices. We can customise just about anything. You can customise your phone, your car, your computer, your television watching, your clothes, your makeup, your hair, your wardrobe, your teddy bear, your coffee, and of course even your face and your body. So what about God? If you could customise your God, if you could design a God for you today, what would he or she or they look like? I guess that most people would want a God that sorts out suffering. We'd really like a God that deals with all the agonies in our lives. I guess that many would like a God who, who provides some sort of financial security in the grinding poverty of our country, in the daily struggle to make ends meet. Our, our, our hearts would really like a God who, who gave us just a little bit more. Perhaps even if we're honest, quite a lot more. We, we'd certainly want a God who deals with death. We'd like a God who takes death away. If you could design your own God, what would he look like? Would he clean up the environment? Stop the senseless destruction of the rhinos? Would he root out the evils that impregnate our society and deliver speedy justice? Imprison the corrupt politician? Punish the rapists and the racists? Humble the greedy? Restrain the violent? What would your God look like if you could customize your God today? Well, come with me to Mark chapter 8, verse 22. It's our final episode in this series. It's one of the most peculiar stories recorded in the eyewitness accounts of Jesus. It's only recorded by Mark, not the other gospel writers, and it's so peculiar that it will jolt us awake like a speed bump in our path. 
<laughs> you know how rumble strips are meant to work. You're driving long distance, lulled into a kind of a driving stupor when all of a sudden you hit it. And your car rattles and jolts and in an instant you're wide awake again. That's what speed bumps, that's what rumble strips are designed to do. To wake us up so that we take special notice. We find ourselves today in the village of Bethsaida. Probably northeastern Sea of Galilee, where the, the Jordan River enters into the Sea of Galilee. It's a fishing village. Mark 8, 22 says this. And they came to Bethsaida, and some people brought to him a blind man. And they begged him to touch him. And, and he took the blind man by the hand and, and led him out of the village. And, and, and when he had spat on his eyes and laid his hands on him, he asked him, do you, do you see anything? And he looked up and said, I, I see men, but they look like trees walking. And then Jesus laid his hands on his eyes again and he opened his eyes and his sight was restored and he, and he saw everything clearly. And he sent him to his home saying, do not even enter the village. I think blind people are absolutely amazing. I'm not sure if you've been watching the recent Paralympics, but in it they had blind soccer and blind handball called goalball. In both sports, the ball has, has bells in it so that they can, that they can play the game just by their ears without seeing. That's truly remarkable. He has a blind man. He gets brought to Jesus. They beg Jesus to touch him and heal him. Of course they want him to be able to see again. And by now they have no doubt that Jesus can do it. Jesus takes the man by the hand, leads him away from the crowd outside the village, away. Unlike many of the miracle workers of our day who want fame and esteem, Jesus wants none of those. He takes this man away to give him his undivided attention. And then he does something that is, well, we would say, pretty gross. He spits on the man's eyes and puts his hands on him. And then he asks the blind man a question, do you see anything? Now, if we spat on a blind person's eyes and asked them, do you see anything? The answer would almost certainly come back, no. In fact, they'd probably slap us across the face because we have spat in their faces. But, but we're expecting a different answer when Jesus puts the question because we've been watching Jesus these past few weeks. We, we've seen Jesus raise a dead girl and, and stop the bleeding of a, of a terribly sick woman. We, we've seen Jesus make truckloads of bread out of, out of nothing. And not just once, but, but twice. We've seen Jesus walk on the water. And if he can do stuff like that, well, then healing a blind man seems to be quite a small challenge for him. And so we're expecting the answer to be yes. We're expecting the blind man to say, yes, yes, I can see. Thank you so much. Because every other time that Jesus has done something like this, that's been the answer. But this time it isn't. And there's the shock. Instead the man says, I, I see people, they look like trees walking around. He sees something. But what he sees is not really seeing at all. He sees blurry and dimly and in a fuzzy fashion. He can see a little bit, but it's not really sight. It's all rather indistinct and hazy and, and disappointing. It's almost as if Jesus has done something good, but, but not so good. He's only done half a job. Uh, perhaps it's a bit like, like when your children get into the bath. You know, the story is getting late and, and you tell them to go off and have a bath and, and, and no sooner have they gone than 20 seconds later they reappear. Did you bath? You ask. It's an obvious question to, to ask. Oh yes, they reply. Did you wash? You ask. Oh yes, they say. And so you go off and you investigate when you enter the bathroom. The soap is bone dry. The water is crystal clear because they didn't, well, they didn't do the job properly. They just dipped themselves in the water. They didn't actually wash themselves. Come back, you call, and do the job properly. Mom, they grumble. This man is healed, but he's not healed until Jesus puts his hands on him a second time. And his eyes were then perfectly restored. He saw, he saw clearly. Now, now it's a peculiar miracle, a, a, a unique miracle. It's so odd that you and I ought to be asking ourselves, what is going on here? What happened that day? Did, did Jesus run out of power? 
Did he have some sort of power failure, but like Eskim? Did, did he not charge his batteries properly that morning? Did he not eat his jungle oats for breakfast? How come he only managed to do half a job the first time? And then we might wonder, is Mark teaching us that perhaps we need a double touch from Jesus in this life? That's a common interpretation of this passage. You need to be converted and then you need to be filled with the Spirit. A second touch. So is that it? No, that's not it. But Jesus is doing something really special. This miracle is unique. Let's read on and see if we can work out the reason why it's working out this way. Immediately after Jesus heals this man, he and his disciples head to the villages of Caesarea Philippi. That is, they head north up the Jordan River. Mark 8 verse 27 says, And Jesus went on with his disciples to the villages of Caesarea Philippi. And on the way, he asked his disciples, Who do people say that I am? They told him, John the Baptist. Others say Elijah. And others, one of the prophets. Here's the question that's been in the background throughout this entire section of Mark. It's a question that people have asked all through the centuries. Who is Jesus? Who is this man that appeared in a Palestinian backwater 2,000 odd years ago? Who is this man whose entire life was only a short 33 years? And his whole public ministry lasted only just on three years. Who is this man? whose life ended in a brutal and bloody execution on a Roman cross that's still celebrated today. Who is this man? Who is this man whose life generated such devotion that it unleashed an army of unpaid soldiers that continues even today? Who is this man who's truly changed the world like few ever have? Jesus said things that still underpin our political and ethical systems. His teachings still form the backbone for what many consider to be right and wrong, even if they don't even realize that they got it from Jesus. Do to others as you'd have them do to you, he said. He said other things like love your enemies and do good to those that hate you. And ever since he lived, men and women have been willing to die for him. Who is this man? And Jesus asks his disciples, who do people say that I am? To which they answer, well, well, most think you're a prophet. Perhaps even a, a special prophet. Perhaps even the prophet. And today you won't have to look hard to find many who just still hold those sorts of views of Jesus. Many think of Jesus as a, as a good religious man, a, a great moral teacher, perhaps even a prophet sent from God. Someone like Elijah or John the Baptist. Verse 29, Jesus asked them, but who do you say that? Ultimately, this question is both personal and universal. You must answer it. And I must answer it. And every human that ever lives will answer it. Who do you say that I am? Verse 29, Peter answered him, You are the Christ. And he strictly charged them to tell no one about him. Let's make sure that we understand what Peter is saying when he answers, You are the Christ. That comment needs to be unpacked a little bit so that we got, we've got some clarity. Christ is not a, he's not a surname like Smith or, or Zuma or Naidu. Christ is a, a title. It means king. It means Messiah. It means the one anointed by God as the ruler of all the world. It means God's agent in the world. The one that was promised. The one that will restore this world to what it is meant to be. Peter is saying to Jesus, you're not just a prophet, nor a religious teacher. You are God's king. The one sent to rule this world. The one to whom every human owes allegiance. It's an astonishing statement. Peter is saying that from watching Jesus, he's come to realize that there is a king that rules over this world. There is actually someone in charge. There's someone to whom we're all accountable. And that someone is Jesus. Peter is saying that there's a God in heaven and he's got a plan for this world. He's not tossed us into space and, and left us to carry on doing things our own way. No, no. God has things under control. He's a plan to sort out the mess of this world and your world. And the way he's going to do it is by installing this Jesus on the throne. 
You're the Messiah. But there's more. The more is not recorded in, in Mark's account. For that we have to turn to Matthew's re record of the same event. Matthew chapter 16 verse 16 records Peter replying, You are the Christ, the Son of the living God. Peter declares that not only is Jesus the King, he declares that Jesus is God's Son. Not just a prophet, he's God in his own universe. Not just a religious teacher, he is deity in humanity. He's not just king of the world, he's God of the universe, the author of everything, who has stepped into the very story that he's authored. Like Shakespeare stepping onto the stage of Macbeth. Or, or Andrew Lloyd Webber singing in the Phantom of the Opera. Or, or Stan Lee making a cameo in a Marvel movie. Please, will you really think about this claim? If your brain doesn't start to ache when you do that, and smoke doesn't start to come out of your ears, you probably haven't understood it. The Bible's claim is that the universe, estimated to be 93 billion light years in diameter, I have no idea how that's calculated, the claim is that 93 billion light year universe was made by Jesus. On this earth, there are somewhere around 8 billion people. The claim is, Jesus made them, all of them, including you and me. Before the world was made, he knows the very thoughts of your heart. Jesus is the God who made it all, and he is at this moment standing right there in front of them. Now, now no sooner have these words come out of Peter's mouth, then there's a dramatic change of gears. Jesus doesn't refute what Peter says. Instead, he starts to teach them what kind of a king he is. And here is the greatest shock of all. Take a look at verse 31. He began to teach them that the Son of Man must suffer many things and be rejected by the elders and the chief priests and the scribes and be killed and after three days rise again. And he said this plainly. And Peter took him aside and began to rebuke him. But, but turning and seeing his disciples, he rebuked Peter and said, Get behind me, Satan. You are not setting your mind on the things of God, but on the things of man. The king of this world, the God of this world, has not come into this world to rule it, but instead to suffer and die. Not long after these words are spoken, Jesus is arrested, he's beaten, he's whipped. They strip him naked, they impale him on a cross. They left him to suffocate and dehydrate and die. The disciples have got the first part of Jesus' identity, but Peter doesn't want the second part. Peter doesn't want a God like that, and nor do I. And you know what? I don't think you do either. <laughs> I've recently been watching a BBC series on the great cathedrals of England. Canterbury, Durham, York, Salisbury, Winchester, Liverpool. They are truly remarkable structures. Liverpool Cathedral took 74 years to build. Others took hundreds of years to build. Pilgrims came from all over Europe. They are buildings that communicate power and influence and wealth. And in each cathedral there is a throne for the bishop to sit on. High and elevated and ornate. That's what the church wants. Power. That's what Peter wants. Power. That's what we want. A God of power. But that's not who Jesus is. He came to die comes to suffer. He comes to serve. He's not a despot or a power-hugging power ruler. He's not like the leaders of this world who build themselves palaces while their people starve. No, Jesus is the Messiah, son of the living God, who serves, suffers, sacrifices, and dies. Just think about that for a moment. A dead God, suffering God, a servant-hearted God, a God who embraces shame and death for us, a God who dies that we might live. And it's only when you see Jesus like that, that you see Jesus clearly. If you see Jesus as King and Lord, you do see him, but you don't see him clearly. The disciples don't see Jesus clearly just yet. They'll only see that after the resurrection, when they too will become like Jesus. The blind man healed in two parts shows us that there are two parts to really seeing Jesus clearly. So, back to the question that I began with today. What kind of a God would you design? A ruling king who sorts out the mess of the world. A God who sorts out the mess of your own life. 
A God who writes your script and takes the pain away. Or a God who dies for you in weakness and shame and suffering and service. When you see him clearly, you'll bow in submission. Your heart will say, yes, yes, be my king. When we see him clearly, we'll stop living as if we're king. We'll stop making demands and instead we'll listen. And we'll listen again. And we'll hear. And we'll become. Our hearts and our lives will be filled with awe and worship that God would serve me. That God would die for me. We'll get goosebumps when we consider that God knows us and values us and treasures us and dies for us. And welling up in us will be love for him. And then when we see clearly we we'll want to become like him. Gone will be the desire to be served. Replaced instead with a love to serve. Our prayers will be give me power to serve. Not give me relief from my pain. Our prayers will be give me this sort of love for people. Give me a heart like yours. When we see Jesus clearly we'll pray. Help me to serve the people of this country that so need someone to serve them. We'll pray, make me a servant of the poor and the vulnerable. When we see Jesus clearly, we'll actually desire to become less powerful and more lowly. When we see Jesus clearly, we'll pray for more smallness, more humility, more power to sweep away our desires so that our hearts are more like his heart. Oh Father, May we see Jesus clearly. Let's pray. Father, we do not see well. We see only partially, dimly, incompletely. Open our eyes that we may see Jesus clearly. That we may see that you're a God who embraces death. That you're a God who loves by suffering. That you're a God who seeks to serve. That you're a God of humility bashfully hiding yourself. That you regard riding a donkey, speaking a word that is often folly, to a world that is consumed by aggression and power. Open our eyes that we may understand, marvel, worship, and then we pray, become as you are. Thanks so much for watching. I'm Jeff Gertzen, I'm the Senior Pastor at St. Stephen's Church and I'd love to get to know you. Why don't you subscribe, click our subscribe button. If you'd like to get to know a little bit more about Jesus, why don't you click on this video on this side. Or if you'd like to get to know a little bit more about our church, then click on this video over here. Thanks for watching. I look forward to hearing from you.